Letitia, you are a man of many words and many opinions. If you could summarize in one word your experiences as a critic and an academic and an expatriate, what would that one word be? Honest. To be honest with yourself, with the truth you know, don't disguise or <laughs> hide things. That's just the way it is. Rich. Dreamer. Dedicated. Experienced. Curious. Hopeful. Meticulous. Known as the man who brought Western Chinese fiction to the West's attention, C.T. Xia was born in Shanghai in 1921. C.T. grew up in a working class family. Even though his mother herself was illiterate, they had a deep appreciation for Western literature and fairy tales that they imparted to their children. One book that had a lasting impact on young C.T. Xia was Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. I came, I didn't get my PhD from Yale. I was studying linguistics. Then I came to Columbia to work. And um, that time the school starts uh, later in September, not right after Labor Day. I was, uh, I didn't have, uh, the professor hired me, just an uh, unofficial letter. I was so scared. So I just came to this country right after Labor Day. So they had no place to put me. The, the professor shared the same office with him, so I met him there. Funny things about the first day, uh, I came, there, there's a Chinese uh, language teacher. She loves to invite people to dinner. I first day here, she invited me to Chinatown for dinner. The next day, I was in his office, came. So he invited me for lunch. I was like, oh, Columbia, the professor, so friendly. And during the lunch, he told me he was divorcing his wife. He wants me to be a, f a friend with him. I was just sometimes uh, in Chinese, uh, English, <laughs> and uh, partly I'm scared of him. He's a professor, a big professor. I just didn't say anything when he invited me to dinner or sometimes I go with him, sometimes I don't go with him. <laughs> C.T. Xia, you were born in Shanghai in 1921. Could you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in Shanghai at that time? I was there in Pudong, you know, it's across the river, so not in the main Manhattan type of thing, you know, I'm the in this suburb type thing anyway. So my father was working then for a factory anyway. And uh, so I was very happy to be born in Pudong because Pudong was already part of the Western civilization. Really? Yeah. What were your, some of your first exposures to literature at that time? Do you remember, did you have any influences growing up as a kid? No, I was, at that time, magazines are very popular in China. So they have magazines for children. So I learned lots of fairy tales in, in, the, in the magazines. So in your family, did you have anyone that was interested in literature that bought you these magazines that read to you? Or were you kind of alone in that interest? No, we, my mother is illiterate. My father works. No such a thing as reading to a child. Hmm. So it's all by myself. So we really read it books which are written in simple Chinese with plus illustrations. Erton Shijie, the children's world, is very good to read. So what started getting you interested in Western literature? I was reading magazines, I told you. And in the, in the magazines, Robert Louis Stevenson, you know his name, was very prominent in translation. So Treasure Island, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, such thoughts, even now I remember. And I love Robert Louis Stevens. I'm sorry he died so young. <laughs> so tell me a bit about studying Yeats in Beijing. How was that? Just years to go. <laughs> I was student in Shanghai, first in Suzhou, then in Shanghai. My college is Shanghai College, Hujiang Daoshu. It's a Christian college, hmm. and uh, I was the top student there. And uh, 
after I graduate, I go to Peking to be with my brother. Yes. And then the award came out. People hated me from then on because I got all the awards. Nobody else can compete. You know, I'm so smart. Nobody can compete for me. <laughs> so, really. And uh, so, <clears throat> The award is from Lee Foundation, a Chinese guy who is rich, and not that rich anyway. And he, first of all, asked everybody to write a composition type of thing, and then suggest a project you would, I mean, I was interested in Western literature. William Blake, yeah. I was, William Blake was, was a minor writer at first, but he was a major artist already. He was made. But that time, you know, everybody was, my brother was in the test too. Everybody was in the test. Because nobody has been to, China, to America for a long time. Mm -hmm. But my project, uh, William Blake, got the first, uh, the, the reader of this judge is William Empson. The, the prominent critic of, from England. Mm -hmm. and he was in China already, and not once this time. He was second time. He, his teacher, I.A. I. A. Richards, was in China too. So they love China and they love me. Because my project is, say, I'm going to study William Blake. And people still know Wordsworth. My brother's Ruth by Wordsworth. Everybody knows, nobody knows Wordsworth. So I was, wow. they hated me from then on. It seemed like you really, it really, you found a very special niche in the university system in terms of William Blake literature. is so important. At that time, I had read two books in English about Blake. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing that year, another third book came out. Third book is a Berkeley guy. He's a young assistant professor with a book, Blake. And I said, I wrote your book. <laughs> I said, could I go to the, your university? She said she checked the chairman. But that time, you know, the, my credits, literary credits are too few. I have a course in Shakespeare, a course in history of Ch American literature, English literature. No more. See. You have to, she said you have to take additional courses to be worked on. But once every year we strong that whatever the, my advisor says is okay. Mm -hmm. So I go to Yale and I Yale. How but was I, Yale? Because my Empson era at Yale, I was Yale is much better than Berkeley then. Yeah. Even, yeah. Even now, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. The thing is this way. You know. Today, you know, people are so stupid. I did everything myself. I tell you how I got to Yale. I went to New York, it's simple, it's a word by a professor. I have two professors. But the thing is, Yale, you got PhD requirements, you have to have three languages in addition to English. Namely, Latin, French, German. Automatically so. Now, you know, it's just half a change. You can use dictionary now, so it's ashamed of them. So I had no time. I had only German at a year in college. I can pass right away now. But to pass French and Latin at two or three years, if you took a score. So that year, first year at Columbia, at, at Columbia right? At Yale. At yeah. Yale. I just quit school, staying in a, all made home, very little, just day and night. I read Latin. You know, Latin is a medieval language, and you have to test the Middle English language, the Latin of the Middle Ages, which is simpler, but still no, you can't. So I read, studied Latin day and night by myself alone, one textbook. He reads a lot. I think when he came to uh, he, Yale, really, it's a good school. Even you know, he 
he was at Yale, he had a very good discipline. And also because when he was uh, young, he studied English literature. He's very studious. He's very, he doesn't really push himself too hard. He's not interested in politics or not interested in anything. He just very steady study. In 1946, C.T. Xia followed in his brother's footsteps and went to Peking University. There, he threw himself into scholarship on English writer William Blake. His thesis was his ticket to Yale University, where he had to work not only on his mastery of the Western canon, but Latin and German as well. A lonely but rewarding time, it set C.T. Xia on his path to being one of the U.S.'s leading scholars of Chinese contemporary fiction. Did you experience any racism or prejudice as being one of the few Chinese nationals at Yale at that time? No. What you say? Did you experience any racism or prejudice no. at Yale at that time, being one of the few Asian students? Yale is hot for everybody. <laughs> That's true at that time. No racism. No. Yeah. Just racism is additional thing afterwards. Oh, yeah. My getting to Yale, I'm the number three person in the English department at Yale. The first one is, he, he, his father was a fa famous, and he is a Liu Wuji, who is a, eventually started America. Mm -hmm. And the second one went to China, then come out. Yeah. So I'm number three, very, wow. very few. Okay. In 1961, you published a, oh. a book, A History of Modern Chinese Fiction. Because this is, nobody has this book. And uh, I was, reading modern Chinese authors to myself. And uh, there's no reference to read, mm -hmm. very few. You know, I went to, go to New York and borrow books from Boston too, I mean, to get books. So I wrote Rockefeller Foundation a letter that I'm applying for a grant to write the history of modern Chinese fiction. At that time, so few people apply. Right. I automatically got the grant three years, four thousand a year. So I'm even while I was graduating, I was helping my parents in Shanghai. They were so proud of me. I gave money four thousand a year to them to, to do. And oh, I you gave it directly to them to your parents? No, no, no. I gave Some whatever I don't use. Okay. I give them about hundred dollars a year a, a, a week. <laughs> oh. <And then. laughs> considered, yeah, inflation considered. Um, so I guess from what I've read, you're considered to be a bit of a contrarian. I know that you've given the well-respected writer Lu Xun a, a negative review, but have been more favorable to writers like Eileen Chang. Zhang Could you Chang tell us a bit about knows. that? Mm -hmm. Only people in Shanghai knew. Yeah. And they knew they don't know how to say anything. I said he was the, she was the greatest story writer in China from time began. Really? Yeah. He read it about the uh, Eileen Chang. He read about the Lu Xun. Of course, everybody uh, know Lu Xun is very popular. He likes some of Lu Xun's uh, work, not all of them, and he didn't like Lu Xun as a person. He think Lu Xun didn't read that much, and. Uh, very jealous, very narrow-minded. But Eileen Chang, he met her once in Shanghai, uh, kind of a informal talk. Then he, after he read it, he told, he told he feel Eileen Chang's language, imagery is so good. He was uh, just debating what, you know, Eileen Chang was a, cons a popular writer, so not a, uh, a classic, so he just feel what then he just he has his own conviction. What would you say? I know in Western literature, when people reflect on the beginning of the fiction novel in Western literature, many argue that a bo the book Don Quixote by Miguel Cervantes. Oh. Don Quixote. Are you familiar with Don Quixote? Don Quixote, of course. Yeah, many in Western literature claim that that's the first novel. Of course, I say that. That's too. where that starts. I begin where that in too. Chinese literature would you say the first modern Chinese novel is? Very early. Where does that start? 
In the Qing Dynasty, I suppose. In the Qing Dynasty? Red Dream Chamber, I think. Dream of Red Chamber, I think of this. Dreams of the Red Chamber would be the first modern Chinese fiction? No. I suppose so. You can call it that, but it's not really. The, the, the Chinese, modern Chinese fiction mm -hmm. began when the Western influence was felt in Shanghai area. So you know. In what time? What, what? And End could of you. Qing Dynasty, beginning End of, of the. Republic time. Okay. That time there's so much change, you know? So if you, for people watching this right now, with your expertise, if there's one book of Chinese modern fiction that you could recommend they read before they die, what would that one book be? There's no such thing as one book. You have to read 10 books at least. <laughs> you read one book, Lu Xun, you know, you read the book. And you read Lao Tzu, Mao Zedong, everything. So there's no such thing as a one book thing. Mm -hmm. One book thing is about Middle Ages. You read one book, Chaucer, you don't read other things anymore. But for modern times, every book can read, you can do three books in a day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so if I had one day to devote to reading modern Chinese literature, and I could read three books, what would those three books be? How can it be three books? <laughs> this is a ridiculous talk. I guess I just want someone like yourself who's an expert, and for people that are watching this interested in Chinese you literature. You want to know the Lu Xun, Zhang Ailing, and uh, Ba Jing, uh, not Ba Jing, Mao Deng. Mao Deng, okay. Yeah. So and Lu Xun, Chang Ailing, Ailing Chang, and... Shen Chong Wen, okay, Qian Zhong Shu, all the ones I mentioned are in my book titles. All right. Every title should be read. Okay. Okay. I think people usually like him because uh, he really is honest. He even doesn't tell white lie. He's a good man. He never be harm anybody. C.T. Xiao wrote the groundbreaking A History of Modern Chinese Fiction in 1961, which looked at various literary movements in China in the 1930s and 40s. Never one to kowtow to popular opinion, C.T. made his mark by promoting the lesser-known novelist Eileen Chang and criticizing the work of the well-respected Lu Xun. As a literary critic, C.T. Xiao, even at the age of 92, stands by his assessments. Before he got sick, uh, he got really got a. He's a different man. But 2009, he was sick and hospitalized for half a year. He had pneumonia. He knew he had pneumonia. But he, he also he's very impatient. He's very quick. So uh, his doctor gave him medicine, but he he choked. His food come from his nose. He insisted to come to this hospital. So. They didn't know he not supposed to eat. They gave him yogurt, so instantly he couldn't breathe. He was on the ventilator for almost three, four months. Yeah. And that's why I think uh, now he's not as coherent as he used to be. And he used to walk a lot. That's why he's very healthy. Yeah. He walked twice a day. And yeah, he, he's happy. Once he's happy, so that's one reason he, he he walks a lot, a lot, used to, used to be, and uh, he's careful about his diet. He's mostly because of he's happy. Nothing can influence him, you know. If he like this person, you recommend this person get a job. No, didn't get it. Doesn't affect him. I would get so angry. He would. He never uh, get angry. If you could. If you could kind of break down what are some of the strongest thematic differences, what are the strongest differences between Chinese fiction and American fiction that you've noticed? Not much. Not much? Because American, Chinese are copying up Western style fiction. Is that a problem? In the tradition of this Chinese fiction different from the modern fiction or Western style. Do you see that as problematic? No problem. It's, no. Everybody follows Western style. Even Africans in Africa, they, when they write, they have to do it. Mm -hmm. No such a thing as a new style. You have conversation, you have kisses, you have fights. Everything the same thing. Yeah. No such thing. You know, your, your idea of... 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. no such thing. Of course, you've seen like a pigtails bound the feet. Those are the Chinese things you find in, only in Chinese fiction. But then not mean a thing. Yeah. It's interesting that you don't find it to be problematic, that it's hard, that, that this sort of Western style has permeated all of the other fictions and storytellings of other cultures. Chinese fiction is Western style fiction. Modern time, everything is Western. Lu Xun is Western. And no one's been able to get away from that. Of Everyone's course not. a part of it. There's yeah. no way. All fiction is Western style. See, that strikes ah. me as being a little bit unfortunate, no? It's almost like... What do you mean there's a new style? You have conversation, you have narrative, you have describing no. kissing. So that... Yeah, no, I meant, I meant to say it's a little unfortunate because it's almost as though there isn't a, a pure Chinese style. We it's have been the affected early literature. by an American. I, I wrote about them traditional Chinese fiction. They're very good too. Yeah. Modern fiction is all... Mo but modern fiction is very westernized. There's no other. We write in Beihua. Mm -hmm. And just all oh, change everything. Yeah. You, you don't want to see the idea of having a unique Chinese style is, is illusion. When you have a short fiction, Western literature has a short fiction too. Mm -hmm. You have fairy tales, you have everything. But medieval times, Western literature in poetry is so much better than Chinese. We don't have such a minority of literature so much. Mm -hmm. Only Western. Now, are there any Chinese modern fiction writers that you're excited about that we should be on the lookout for? Some up and comers? No, I, I, I don't care now. Yeah. I read my book, that's all. Yeah. Even Mo Yen or my wife said, I don't care. Yeah. He doesn't know English, so I don't care. Why I? I'm 90 years old, more than what? care about this stupid man. And so as a 92-year-old man, I have to ask you, what is your secret? How do you live so long? What's that? As a 92-year-old man, what is your secret? How do you live so long? I take walks, I eat carefully. I was a smoker too, but by 40 years, I'm 40, I stopped smoking. Okay. Do you have anything else you'd like to say about modern Chinese fiction before? before? I say the last thing in my book. Well, could you summarize it a little bit for us, for people who haven't had a chance to read your book? Maybe who'd be interested in it, but want mm. to know more. You read my book, I also, the writers I mentioned are all there. Okay. The new writers I didn't read, I don't know. All right. Before his book came out, mostly in this country, they study classic Chinese literature, and uh, people don't pay much attention to the modern literature. But after this book, because he writes a beautiful English, it is true. I think he writes beautiful English, so people accept his opinion, and the people follow him. So the, there are lots of people studying Chinese literature because of him. That's true. That's, yeah.